We've done over 150 front-end interviews, and these are the most asked CSS questions you should know if you want to pass a front-end interview. In this video, we will also reveal the number one mistake front-end developers make when answering CSS questions. And if you stay until the end, we will also reveal what's the most important CSS interview question and how to answer it properly so you never fail a front-end interview ever again. First CSS interview question is, what is the difference between EM and REM? So they are both relative sizing elements. That means you can use them to, to give relative size and they'll be responsive. M, it's referring to the font size of the parent element and REM, it's pretty much the same thing, but the R stands probably for root and it's binded to the HTML element. So it means the font size of the HTML tag in the document not of the immediate parent. Awesome, makes sense. Understood, now um, we're gonna move on with a more practical question. So can you open up the link on the board? I sent you an Escalidero board. Uh, can you open up that link? Okay, give me a sec. And share that really quickly, yes, awesome. So um, yeah, let's imagine we have a div element. That's our div element that you see on the screen. And those are kind of the CSS specs, right? So we have a width of 300 pixels, the border is one pixel, uh, we have a padding, that's 10 px, and then we have a margin of 5 px. Okay, and we set this Mona Lisa image, right? We're gonna set that as a background to this element. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the element. We're gonna set the background. My question is, how much of the image, okay, how much of the image will be actually visible once we do that? Okay, so the width is 300, padding is 10. We have a border and margin of five. So if I were to set this yeah. as a background yes by default it would probably occupy the content of the box and following the box model also the padding so i would assume it's gonna display like this so that would be our content and this would be i would say our background following the box model but of course it would be cut off here depending on how we set it as a background awesome that is correct now you did mention the box model. Okay, can you explain more? Can you tell me more about the box model? Sure, so it's basically the way that in CSS we manage how content is being displayed and pretty much every element has a uh, content box, call it that way, which is, I guess, what mm -hmm. we see here. And so we have the content inside and it can have a width either implicitly calculated by the browser based on the content or explicitly set by us, like in this case. So that would be an explicit width. And then the content would have to adapt to that. And basically the box model dictates how the padding and margin will behave. The margin um, doesn't account for content. It's just kind of outside. And then the, um, and the inside, uh, we have the content and then the padding. And in the case of background images, they do occupy the space of padding if there is any padding. Now, let's think about what if we had a box shadow? Now, where will that box shadow actually display? Uh, so whenever you have a box shadow, I think it will just appear over here where the margin is. So depending on how much shadow we add, it will just appear here. This question that Bogdan just answered brings me to the number one mistake front-end developers make when doing CSS interviews. And that is that they get distracted by shiny objects like animations, transitions, and transforms instead of focusing on core fundamentals like the box model, specificity, selectors, inheritance, and cascading. In fact, if you master those basics, you will be able to answer 99% of CSS questions correctly, just like Bogdan did a few seconds ago. Which means the most important CSS question you will ever get in a technical interview will be, can you explain the CSS box model? That's it. Be able to answer that and the rest of the interview will be a piece of cake. Now, once you're familiar with the box model and you want to learn more, a lot of front-end developers ask themselves, hey, but how much CSS should I know? Well, it depends on the kind of position you're applying for. Based on our experience, if you know the box model and the main layout techniques, including Flexbox and Grid model, you will do just fine. Now on to the next question. Okay, Bagnan, I did send you a code sample. Can you pull that up? Okay, now check it out. We have an index HTML. Then we have a, a style sheet that will apply the styles for that index HTML, pretty basic index HTML. Uh, we have a div element there. It has an ID, nav bar, and we have a class that has nav item. Uh, and you can see those things 
are specified also in our style sheet. Now, the question is, what it's the color? What, what color will the nav bar have? And can you tell me why? Um, so we have the div and we apply the ID and the class and we use the selectors to apply the styles and it's the same style. So I would assume this, this two selectors will cascade and following probably the one with the spe higher specificity will be selected. And in this case, it's probably the ID. ID has precedence. It has a higher uh, specificity than, uh, than the class. So I would assume this would be blue. And from what I see, the editor, it even, it's even telling me the specificity. So here I have zero, one, zero, and here one, zero, zero. And mm -hmm. one, zero, these are powers of two. So this would be probably a two to the second. So that's a four over a specificity of two to the one, which is a two. So okay. we will probably be uh, blue. Um, okay, Bogdan, sounds great. Now, how would you go about testing this? Uh, so I guess probably the easiest way to test this would be to see if it renders. Let me open this. Okay, so what I see for now is this hello. So it looks like a CSS is not really being picked up. Mm -hmm. Let me check the code. Okay, so we have the style sheet, but it's not a reference in the HTML. I'm going the to... Can you share the style sheet right now? I don't see it. Yes. Yeah, we so what it. I was saying is there's no reference in the HTML to the style sheet. Um, I'm going to add one for the purpose of the test. Uh, I'm assuming you have a style, is it styles.css? And yeah, you just to be yes. semantically correct, this is a style sheet. And let me close tag here and see. Okay. Can you so see I that? Save Let's it. see if it works. I'm going to refresh now. Oh, there you go. So I do not see. Could you share your screen? Because you open it up in, in a different window. Yeah. Okay. So it's blue. Okay. Amazing. Looks like it works. So yeah, always check that the CSS style sheet is actually linked. That's the moral <laughs> of the story. Okay, Wait. Bagdan, we're going to move on with the next question. And now we're going to talk about CSS specificity, right? That's what, what the, the previous question was about applied to, as applied to code. So my question is, what is CSS specificity? Okay, if you can give me an example. And, you know, what are the implications of CSS having that kind of specificity and actually CSS being a global language over production level code? Yeah, sure. So CSS specificity, it's basically needed because we can have different styles applied to the same element and we need to figure out which ones to actually apply when we render that element. So what the browser does is to, based on how the style rule was applied, it, either it was an ID, like in that case, or a class, or just a simple tag, figure out what is the importance of that rule by calculating the specificity and basically apply the rule with the highest specificity. The highest specificity you can have it's when you add this important next to a tag and then it will always be applied so that's how the browser basically figures out if you have multiple rules applied to the same element which one to apply which one to render understood understood and what what are some implications of this in um, a real life code base that you work with so one of the difficult things is that you might end up if you're not careful about your selectors you might end up modifying the styles on elements that um, you didn't want it to by applying for example very generic rules or um, yeah, you basically have this conflict where you, you end up changing the styles of a global element by mistake. And uh, one of the things I used in the past to avoid this, it's using the BAM language where you start writing very specific nested rules. There's a specific mm -hmm. convention with the BEM, or you can use CSS in JS, which will basically generate a unique class name. And that makes sure that there's no uh, specificity issues or conflicts when you render your components in a framework like React, for example. Yeah, this is implemented by uh, style components. Right? They, they generate a unique class, like a hash class name that it's unique, so you don't have any global naming uh, issues, right? Uh, cool, but now we're gonna move on to a completely different question topic, very important for performance nevertheless. Um, and the question is, what is critical CSS? And can you explain to me how critical CSS it's actually used? Sure, so critical CSS, it's CSS that we can extract because it's, only, uh, it's the only CSS needed to render the above default portion of a page. So whenever we render our application, we're talking about what the user sees in the viewport without scrolling. Mm -hmm. So the first thing they see, we can actually extract those roles that render that. 
and mm-hmm. ship them differently as critical CSS. And it's called critical because it's the CSS you can render or you need to render in the critical rendering path to have no cumulative layout shift. So that would allow us to basically render as little CSS as possible in our first render and make the page faster. And then we can load the rest of the CSS after that initial render. Understood. Makes sense. Cool. Now uh, on to the next question. It's uh, more of an architecture, CSS architecture question, which is how do you manage CSS in a big scale application? Whenever we have bigger applications, I'm thinking back to my experience, whenever you have several teams, for example, working on the same front end application, we end up having troubles with one team deploying code and destroying the view of another team without even them noticing, because again, CSS is this global namespace and you can easily pollute it by adding uh, very generic selectors. One of the solutions I already mentioned was uh, CSS in JS. That was pretty good. But when, at least when I remember the first time we implemented CSS in JS, the problem is it was very difficult to cache our styles um, because again, CSS in JS would be injected in the JavaScript. So we actually had to change the configuration. And even if we have CSS in JS, which we use style components for, extract the styles in a different style sheet and then bundle that and still have the CDN caching on it. So we, are, we still have performance in not our CSS will be shipped with our bundle um, and that would be less performant. So that would be number two. I would always use a CDN and I would always try to extract the styles and ship them as uh, in a CDN with the right caching policy so you can mm-hmm. cache them. And the other practice that you could do is to extract, for example, the CSS that your design, if you have a design system, uses and ship that differently from the specific styles that will change a lot. And what that would allow you to do is to have a much longer caching policy on your design system. Uh, so unless you change the design system, the users doesn't have to download this huge CSS file from the design system. They only need to download maybe the small style sheet that comes from your components. Okay, folks, three things I want you to do now. First of all, if you have any technical interview questions that you want Bug and I to answer in all of these videos, then drop them in the comments. Second, if you want to find out what your technical gaps are for you to get to that next level as a senior engineer, then check out the free technical assessment we put together for you. And third, it is proven that developers who have a mentor are almost five times more likely to get promoted and earn more. If you want Bogdan and I to personally mentor and coach you so you become a confident, competent senior developer, then you can book a chat with me and see if we could be a fit. As for us, we will see you in the next one.